Well, I think we're going to get started now. So I wanted to go over the SGU lectures for Pathophys with you guys so that you can kind of see like what we need to focus on and what we can kind of skip more or less. So I would say that you probably need about 45 minutes to an hour every day to review SGU lectures. I would not completely skip them, but I would do them after all my other reviews. So let's just show you what I did. So first thing I did was pull up my heart failure uh, boards and beyond video. And then I also pulled up my first aid and lectures. So the first thing I'm gonna do is review the first aid page, right? So there's really only one page on heart failure, which means everything in here is the most important things about heart failure, right? So it's a clinical syndrome of a pump dysfunction. And I just watched the boards video and I know that the first couple minutes, he kind of talks about how the pump works. So what happens, you get congestion, which is backflow and low perfusion. So the low perfusion is going to be measured by decreased cardiac output. Symptoms include dyspnea, orthopnea, fatigue, okay, so shortness of breath and tiredness. This S3 heart sound is big. So S3 heart sounds happen whenever you are fluid overload. It's not specific for heart failure. It's just for any fluid overload versus S4, which is for any sort of um, hypertrophy in the heart. Rails just fancy for fluid in the lungs, JVD, which can happen when we have congestion or fluid backflow, and pitting edema. Okay, those are all super broad, none of them really specific for heart failure, but they're all just signs of fluid overload. So now we talk about the two types, systolic and diastolic. So the hallmark, the definition of systolic is a reduced ejection fraction. Okay, so really that's the only difference between the two if you're going to say definition wise. So it's less than 55%, I think. Um, and you're going to have an increased end diastolic volume, which makes sense because we said congestion. Okay, but we're going to flip down here and it's going to have for diastolic, it's going to have a normal end diastolic volume. So if we can't get enough fluid out, we're going to have fluid buildup in the heart. This is usually due, due to decreased contractility, due to heart in um, heart attacks or a dilated cardiomyopathy. And we know that our dilated cardiomyopathy is most likely due to Coxsackie, at least for warts. <laughs> so then we have diastolic dysfunction. This one we don't talk about as much. You have the preserved ejection fracture. You have normal fluid technically. Um, you have decreased compliance, which is usually due to hypertrophy. So this is when we talk about hokum or somebody with a really big heart. Okay. Um, then we talk about right versus left heart failure. So left heart failure is by far the most common. It's also the most important because our left heart is way more important than our right heart. Um, and also left heart failure causes right heart failure. So it's definitely the most important. So right heart failure often results from left heart failure. The exception is core pulmonale, um, refers to right heart failure due to pulmonary causes. So Something like, I don't know, like 70% of core pulmonale is just COPD. So you get COPD and your blood vessels to your lungs are so overworked and so constricted due to hypoxic vasoconstriction that your right heart basically gives up and is like, I'm not doing this anymore. So, but most of the time, right heart failure is just due to left heart failure. And when we have right heart failure and left heart failure, we call that together congestive heart failure. Because basically you're just so congested and so fluid overloaded that your whole body is just completely volume overloaded, congestion. So we talk about treatments, okay? Um, it's really important, you're gonna see this list and we really wanna remember, let's see if I can write this out here, if it will let me. Right. I don't want to sign a document. Oh, sticky note. Perfect. Okay. So when we talk about drugs that increase mortality and heart failure, we want to think of RAS, right? So we have renin, angiotensin, uh, excuse me, spelling, aldosterone system, right? Okay. So in order to prevent remodeling and prevent um, the symptoms of heart failure and heart attack due to fluid overload, we have to block RAS. So how do we block renin? Beta blockers. How do we block angiotensin? ACE inhibitors. How do we block aldosterone? Spirolactone. So we don't usually talk about it in that way, but that is why these drugs are the, the mainstay. So um, 
that's where we see here ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, except an acute heart failure, because like if the person's dying, you don't want to lower the blood pressure. That's all it's saying. If they come in with a blood pressure of, you know, 80 over whatever, like you don't want to give them a beta blocker. And spirolacta. These three decrease mortality because they all block RAS, all prevent remodeling. You can also do thiazides or loop, but those are just to get rid of some of the fluid overload. That's usually more for the lung symptoms. Loop diuretics are your big guns for this. Um, hydralazine and nitrate therapy improve um, both symptoms in select patients. The select patients is African American. So we have good data that says when you can combine hydralazine and nitrates, you have to add the nitrates so that the um, you don't get like angina and uh, vasoconstriction and stuff like that or whatever it is. Um, sorry, it's been a little while since I reviewed this, guys. Um, so that's for the African-American patients, typically. OK, so all of that, just to summarize, lots and lots of fluid. You have systolic with reduced ejection fraction and diastolic with preserved. OK, then we go into left versus right. So when the left heart backs up, so let's kind of go to a picture here. So heart versus right heart. OK, good old gooks. So we want to remember this is a gorgeous picture. Let's see if this website will let me look at it. No, mm, here we go. OK. So normally the left heart takes the oxygenated, nice, beautiful red heart from the lung and pumps it out to your body, right? So when you have left heart failure, two things are going to happen. One, all of this fluid is going to backflow into your lungs and you're going to get congestive lung symptoms. And two, you're not going to have the output from the aorta to the rest of your body. And that's going to be a problem. Granted, during compensation, neither of those things are going to happen. So sometimes in like more difficult U world questions or RX questions, they want you to differentiate between compensated and decompensated heart failure, right? So compensated is when we know your heart is failing, but you're not really showing it. Your blood pressure is pretty stable. Your lungs aren't drowning. You're doing all right. The moment the patient comes in with a super low heart, um, super low blood pressure, and their lungs are full of fluid, and you need to put them on a loop diuretic. That's when that's happening. Um, so we can go back to our first aid here. And we can see that here. So there's three things that we're going to list here. And all of them are just fancy medical terms for shortness of breath and fluid in your lungs. Orthopnea is when you're supine. And look, increased venous return. OK. Then you have the waking up in the middle of the night. Oh, look, increased venous return. OK. And then you have the pulmonary edema increased venous return. So I'm not going to memorize these three things as separate things. I'm going to consider them, consider them all the same. It's increased venous return to the lungs. Um, you can get these heart failure cells due to the um, hemosiderin-laden macrophages, okay, versus right heart failure. So the right heart pumps deoxygenated blue to the lungs, right? So two things are going to happen when you have right heart failure, and the same rules apply to compensation. Now, we said that two things caused right heart failure, left heart failure, which means you already have lung symptoms, or core pulmonale, which means you have COPD and already have lung symptoms. So the presence of lung symptoms don't exclude right heart failure. It's just you're usually going to have lung symptoms either way. If it's pulmonary edema, it's due to left heart failure. And if it's COPD, you just have COPD, 40 pack year history. So what we're going to see is, you know, the right heart has, which you can't see right here, the um, JVD coming off of it, right? And then down here, it also goes to the liver. So if we searched uh, right heart JVD and liver veins. Let's see if we can get a better picture of that. Oh, that's a beautiful picture of JVD. Uh, here we go. So that shows us a decent picture of why we're going to get the JVD. And then let's see if we can see a liver picture. Uh, hepatic vein. Okay. Google's failing me, guys. Here we go. 
well, you get the idea. The the hepatic vein goes to the right heart. Okay, so back to the first date. And I know that I'm like exhausting this topic, but heart failure is always really high yield. And I don't think you guys mind the extra lecture. So what are we gonna see with right heart failure? We're basically gonna see swelling places other than the lungs, right? Because all of your veins drain your arms and your legs into the right heart. So what do we see? Peripheral edema. Oh, my leg veins can't drain into my right heart. They can't get to my lungs to oxygenate. And look, it's due to increased venous pressure again. Venous return is the phrase for left heart failure. Venous pressure is for right. But in both cases, that's what's happening. It's all about the veins. Should I do the venous distension? We just talked about that. And then our nutmeg liver, increased central venous pressure. And that can lead to cardiac cirrhosis, but very rarely. Then they have this beautiful flow chart, okay? Left ventricle contractility, you get the pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema, decreased right heart flow. And then I wanna talk about a little bit about this RAS system, okay? I cannot even tell you how many questions I have gotten wrong on heart failure and RAS or heart failure and per total peripheral resistance, okay? No matter what their blood pressure is, no matter what arrow question, no matter right or left or compensated or decompensated, heart failure is going to have vasoconstriction because your body is trying to compensate and it's going to have increased RAS, whether we want it or not. So you always want to say increased TPR, increased vasoconstriction, increased RAS. That is a huge problem with why um, heart failure gets worse and worse. Now, I did want to pull up... Bear with me for one second. Do, 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 do. All right, sorry guys, let me just pull up one other thing. Share my screen again. Okay, so um, my the first aid version that I have right here. Oh. Hmm. This is the picture I'm trying to show you guys. Perfect. Okay, so my my first aid doesn't have this picture, but the 2020 and 2021 have it here. So this is under the peripheral edema section. So they have two little um, pressure volume loops, which I'm trying to zoom in here. So this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, okay? So this is our classic one. This is one due to heart attacks or dilated cardiomyopathy, like we said, Coxsackie. The big thing we're seeing here is a decrease in contractility, okay? Which is this slope here. So this is gonna drop. Of course, all our volume is pushed higher because we're fluid overloaded. We can't contract. Um, but you'll notice that the size remains pretty even. The stroke volume is not going to increase because, well, we're having problem pumping out, right? So you're going to see this drop in contractility, and we're also going to see this increase in volume, okay? And then we also have um, preserved ejection fraction, which is we're not going to have that big change in volume. We're not going to have a change in, in um, ejection fraction and con contractility. The only thing that's gonna change is this thing, compliance. And there's really nothing else that changes this bottom line and moves it up like this, this compliance thing. Also, this one's just like less high yield in general, but this is what you'd see with hypertrophy. So this is the curve you really wanna be able to recognize. Lots of fluid, about the same size, decreased contractility. Okay, so now that I've reviewed the first aid, now I can go ahead, do, 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 do and review my boards and beyond. Okay, so I'm not going to watch this whole video now, but I am just going to flip through it to make a point. So this is the basics of heart failure video, okay? I'm just going to mention the things that he put in bold, in bright red, because they're the important. Of course, low cardiac output, that's the definition of heart failure, okay? Here he talks about the pump. You guys can watch this. He's saying, hey, look, pressures are going to rise because we have increased fluid. Then he talks about how the flow loop is going to look shortness of breath. He talks about high pressure in the venous system, jugular venous pressure. We just talked about that and capillary leaking. Um, capillary leaking isn't the main reason. It's really just the increased hydrostatic pressures. Hydrostatic is key for 
um, heart failure. We're not talking about oncotic pressures. We're talking about um, hydrostatic. He goes to the left versus right. We already talked about that. Most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. We talked about that too. Um, you know, some very vague symptoms, weight loss, confusion, cool extremities. That doesn't really tell us anything, but don't be surprised if you see it. Here's a picture of our um, hemosiderin uh, heart failure cells, which how to measure jugular venous distension. What pitting edema looks like. He's showing us an increased hydrostatic pressure here. Um, he's also reminding us the difference between S3 and S4, which we just talked about. He's also mentioning a displaced apical pulse. If the PMI isn't where it's supposed to be, if it's more pushed to the left, we probably have left heart failure or increased heart. Um, then he talks about why the total peripheral resistance. And see, here it is. TPR is always high. I get that wrong over and over and over again. And it just tells you that, hey, look, if your cardiac output is going down, your TPR has to go up to compensate, which is great. And it's also due to RAS. That angiotensin is going to vasoconstrict. Here we're talking about the RAS. Decreased circulating volume, but increased total body pressure. So you don't have enough blood in your vessels, but you have too much everywhere else. That's when AMP comes to play. Um, BNP is a better player. BNP and AMP, here we go. They're basically, this is the most beautiful picture right here. RAS. AMP, BMP. They try and balance it out. BMP is what we check for when we think you might have heart failure. It's very nonspecific, but it tells us, hey, look, your heart has too much fluid. So lots of times we'll be like, what's going to be high? BMP is going to be high. RAS is also going to be high because they're always trying to balance each other out. It's just that RAS is much stronger than BNP and AMP, so RAS is going to win, but the BMP is still going to be high. Um, he talks about some drugs that help um, you guys can review that with a farm. And he talks about, you know, uh, heart catheterization, how we measure that. Now, there's three more videos on, uh, let's see, on heart failure. Okay, that was just the basics. Next one is systolic and diastolic, which we went through. He goes through concentric and eccentric. You can watch that. You should review it. Restrictive, eh. Acute heart failure and chronic heart failure. Chronic is really more high yield. He's gonna go a lot into how the RAS system works. These are really exhaustive. He's a cardiologist, he really loves it. If you get what I've talked about so far, jump into questions, go for it. If it still seems really, really confusing, you should go through and watch these, okay? So now that we finished that, now that took me, I don't even know how many minutes, not too long. Granted, I didn't actually watch the video, but I reviewed the first aid in depth. I made sure I understood everything in the first aid, and then you would go and watch that video. When you finish the basics and the chronic, because I'm telling you those are the most important, now it's time to review our lecture. So 22 minutes probably would take me about 40 if I'm pausing and taking notes, and this one would probably also take me about 40 minutes, chronic heart failure. So probably around an hour and a half for videos, half an hour for my first aid, and now I'm gonna jump into the lectures. Okay. Whew. Okay, so um, I would love to start a timer. All right, so this says um, it is 627 right now. So I'm gonna try and get through this video, this lecture about 15 minutes because I wanna spend between 45 minutes and an hour total on my lectures per day. I don't wanna spend more time than that. Um, granted, I know this material pretty well, so it should only take me 15 to 20 minutes. That's kind of my idea, right? Okay, so first of all, we have this case presentation. Ankle swelling. Ooh, that sounds like right heart failure. Shortness of breath. That sounds like left. Hypertension. Okay, so he has risk factors for heart failure. Now I'm going down to his blood pressure. Whoa. Okay, really high. So he has very untreated hypertension. It's his Left heart has been trying to push against this vasoconstriction, pushing against this vasoconstriction, it's given up. So then we see pitting ankle edema, cold, clammy skin. Oh, his liver is hepatomegaly. That must be right heart failure. And then we see her S3 and crackles to confirm. So I'm seeing right heart failure and left heart failure. I'm saying that he's in full um, compensated congestive heart failure, okay? So all of this stuff, I've already seen ankylodemia, shortness, and large liver, S3. All of this is in first aid. I'm not going to write any of it down. On to the next slide. Definition of heart failure. Oh, the pump isn't working. 
Okay, that's in first aid. Onset, acute or chronic, makes sense, can be left or right, all in first aid. Okay, now he goes into this criteria. You absolutely do not need to memorize this criteria. He's just giving you a list of things that we would actually use clinically, okay? So I'm just gonna go through, okay, that's left, that's left, that's right, that's left, that's fluid overload, cardiomegaly. We didn't talk about that, but it does make sense. Displaced PMI, chest x-ray can show that. Pulmonary edema, we talked about. Weight loss, okay? Uh, usually we see a weight gain or weight loss. That's not super specific. Minor criteria, leg, coughing at night, hepatomegaly, pleural effusion, tachycardia. Hold on, why do we have tachycardia? Well, again, where well, heart is trying to compensate for what's going on, so it's going to be faster. Or weight loss. So that's why I was like, when I read, you know, weight gain or weight loss, it's, it's not that important. Okay. So left versus right. That's in first aid, so I'm not really expecting anything new. Okay. Okay. Um, it can be systolic, diastolic, both. Yep. Makes sense. Matches my first aid. Okay, causes of systolic. So systolic is when my heart, the pump, it says I am too tired to pump, usually the left. Aging makes sense. Dilated was in first aid. Coronary artery disease is what causes a heart attack, and we just read the heart attack, right? If we flip back to our first aid, I just want to go right back up here because we're talking about systolic. We said it was due to, um, let me just move this down, often due to ischemia, coronary artery disease, or dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay, so that matches. I'm not writing it down. Valvular heart disease. That wasn't mentioned, but that's a thing. The valves can kind of overwork us, especially aortic stenosis, okay? Aortic stenosis is kind of the same as hypertension. These two both really increase your after load and are really high risk factors um, for systolic dysfunction. Infiltrated diseases, and myocarditis, that's our dilated cardiomyopathy. It's pretty much the same, okay? Okay, this is the same thing that Jason Ryan was talking about, right? Um, so uh, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So we just said that we're gonna have tachycardia. We're gonna have increased heart, heart rate if our stroke volume isn't working so well. And if we have a reduced rejection fraction, that's exactly what's gonna happen. And then we saw when the cardiac output decreases, our total peripheral resistance is gonna increase, right? So I'm just gonna put a sticky and remind myself what I just saw in Jason Ryan that cardiac output decreases. Stroke volume decreases. Heart rate increases. This sounds like an arrow question for sure. TPR increases. Okay. So just so I can remember, those are kind of the big physio features, right? Because the whole point of pathophys is to combine the physio, why you learned about stroke volume and heart rate in the first place, with a disease, which is heart failure. Okay, so there's my sticky. Okay, now this is the flow volume loop that we saw in the new version of first aid. So I'm not super worried about these because I know it's in my first aid. I do want to remember that this vol volume over here is end diastolic, this is end systolic, and then the width is stroke volume. Okay. So, okay. Um, stroke volume equals end diastolic minus end systolic. I should probably get an Anki card on that, right? I would also probably get an Anki card on the little sticky note thing I got right here, right? Because I know that those are the parameters they're going to be asking me about. Because Grace is telling me that they're in first aid. Jason Ryan mentioned them and the lecture mentioned them. But so far, I haven't seen anything here that really deviates from first aid or Jason Ryan, okay? Um, stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected by each ventricle in the beat. You need to know that, okay? Um, stroke volume increases with an increase in end diastolic volume. It also increases with a decrease in systolic, okay? Um, now they're talking about ejection fraction, which we said was important because it was how we actually decided what type of heart failure we had, which is stroke volume over end diastolic. And we just said that, you know, just as a reminder here, sticky note, if stroke volume equals end systolic volume minus end diastolic volume, right? So we're using that end diastolic volume twice. It's really important, right? Did I do the right subtraction? Oh, if you get a negative number, you did it wrong. Okay. 
All right, so here we go. Here is our thing. So we were just talking about how, and um, we're gonna have this taller um, contractility. We're gonna have more volume over here. And then the compliance line was down here, okay? So it's just a reminder about these different volume parameters, but we're just learning the heart failure ones. We're not trying to learn everything right now, okay? All right, so I'm on slide 15 of 33, so I'm just gonna check my time. It's 6.34, so we're, I think we're making pretty good time, okay? All right, so we looked at the normal. He's just showing us all the parameters, but now we can actually talk about what's happening with heart failure. This is the exact same curve that's in our first aid. So again, I'm not gonna write anything down for this, okay? I see that it's moved over to the right. I have more of an end diastolic volume. I see that the stroke volume is relatively the same, but a little bit decreased, just like that, that little sticky note that I just wrote. I'm gonna write it again here because I think it's really important. Stroke volume and cardiac output decrease and heart rate and total peripheral resistance or vasoconstrict increase. Okay, so I'm gonna see that here. Inertropy decreases. Now we didn't really talk about inertropy. It wasn't in the first aid. It probably was in the boards and beyond. Inertropy is contractility, but they didn't really say that. So I have two options, right? I can either go into my first aid and where it talks about contractility, write down inertropy. But you know what? We have some information here. So I'm gonna pull up my notes here. All right, so heart failure notes. So, so far, some summary things, right? So we have systolic and diastolic, okay? So systolic is way more important, okay? We're gonna have an increased uh, heart rate and TPR, vasoconstriction due to RAS, typing fast, and a decreased cardiac output definition. And uh, come on guys, we did it three times. What was the other thing that decreased? Stroke volume, okay? Um, we also had that formula, but I'm not gonna write it down. So inotropy decreases, okay? That's the first thing that I've seen in this lecture that wasn't in the first aid or wasn't really focused on, right? So contractility. Okay, so we just wanna remember that. Okay, so that's the only note I've taken so far. All right, back to the lecture. Okay, so inotropy. All right, changes in left ventricular um, systolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction, the left heart is really the one that pumps. So left and systolic are pretty much synonymous. They're not actually the same thing, but they pretty much are. Okay, so. So loop A is normal, loop B is loss of myocardium. So a decrease in ventricular pressure during systole, an increase in ventricular diastolic pressure, decrease in stroke volume, increase in systolic pressure. So we can see that this is getting much more narrow, decreased stroke volume. We can see the contractility is decreased. And that's all. Okay, so this is with a heart attack. Okay, this is when our heart is actually like dying. So it's just getting smaller. All right, so, so far we have just to kind of compare these two. So this is what I would do. I would definitely take a picture of this and take a picture of this and add it to my document. I don't, um, it's gonna take me a minute to do that. So I would just say add, add low volume for heart attack versus systolic heart failure, right? Because those things are pictures that would likely show up on your exam. All pictures are very high yield. SGU loves showing us these pictures. They love asking us which ones, okay? Um, patients with systemic hypertension. Okay, so this is another one I'd have to add to the list. Well, height is always after load, right? So let's go to first aid for a second. Let's go back to what these pressure volume loops mean, all right? And we'll not make you guys just remember this from term one, because I know you haven't seen it for a while. <coughs> Excuse me, not COVID, just asthma. Oh, this copy doesn't have them. My apologies. All right, we'll just look at this. Okay, so taller, afterload. Okay, I always say afterload atop, 
And I'll write a little note here. So aortic stenosis and hypertension, biggest afterload. Aorta atop, top, afterload, atop. Okay, so we see that there. Okay, when we're talking about preload, we'll do another sticky for that. Preload is the width here, so it's the green. Um, so preload equals width. So we see this with regurges. Regurges are always going to make this guy way wider and increase our stroke volume. Afterload is always going to make us taller and make stroke volume harder. Okay. So um, the newer um, first aid versions, which I don't have downloaded here, have this drawn out for every heart murmur. So go look at the aortic stenosis one. Look at how tall it is. Go look at the aortic regurge one. Look at how wide it is. You're going to see those things as trends. All right, back to our first aid for heart failure. Also, guys, like cardio is kind of a bear. This is okay. This is this is where we pause. We've learned a lot so far. So cardio is a lot, a lot, a lot. It's one of the hardest topics that you guys are starting with right after an exam. You're exhausted. Please don't think that you have to have cardio mastered in one or two weeks. This is something that you're going to be studying until you take step and after you take step. Renal and palm are much shorter, much more simple. You're going to have time to come back to the cardiac stuff. You don't need to understand everything perfectly. But what you want to have down is the first aid stuff at a minimum. Okay, that's what your Anki cards are for. That's what your Rx questions are for. Right. OK, back to the lecture. OK, so we see this afterload is increased with systemic hypertension, because like I just said, um, aortic stenosis and hypertension are the two things that are going to really increase your afterload and afterload is going to make us taller. Okay, so I would add that to the sheet of things they talk about. All right, so now we're going way back to Murray and we're talking about preload and catecholamines and hypertrophy. Okay, so when we have more fluid, we have more preload. Preload is fluid. Afterload is vasoconstriction, preload is fluid. So if we have an increase in preload, we are fluid overloaded. That makes sense. We're also going to release catecholamines. This is another reason we're vasoconstricting, because how else are we going to have um, these two things, right? TPR, right? Heart rate. What increases your TPR and heart rate? Catecholamines. So vasoconstriction due to RAS and catecholamines okay so those are high as well and that's another reason why beta blockers are so helpful because beta blockers prevent this you're also going to get hypertrophy okay this is what they talk about in the chronic heart failure video the difference between eccentric and concentric um okay remember that um oh man got a little note here since you guys need to know it okay so eccentric if you put all of those c's together you're going to get dilated, okay? And concentric is with high afterload. So aortic stenosis and hypertension, okay? So that's how I remember. Back up. High yield. High yield, high yield. Okay. Limitations. When each of these mechanisms reach their maximum physiological limits, heart failure becomes uncompensated, which we call decompensated. No one says uncompensated. I don't, I don't know where you got that from. Okay, more of these flow volume loops, okay? Just be really familiar with the pictures, understand what they mean. In fact, go back to your boards and beyond right now and say, whoa, this whole lecture is not about heart failure. This whole lecture is about flow volume loops. So, Let's see where the flow volume loop video is. Well, he goes over it in the valve disease. That one's important. Uh, maybe it's in, oh, physio. Duh. OK, so I would stop right now. You've already watched two videos. And I would say, listen, now that I'm seeing this lecture, I'm seeing that it's way more about flow volume loops than heart failure. And I haven't reviewed those in a while. So here it is, PV volume loop. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to watch this video. Okay, for you guys, we're not going to watch it. We're just going to flip through. 
I'm going to see, okay, I have just learned that this is contractility and this is compliance. Grace said that a top is afterload and width is preload. Okay, cool. He's going to talk about this being end diastolic and this end systolic. Okay, cool. Now he's starting to label the things. He's putting where the mitral valve is. Oh, look, A is our top. The aortic valve is a top. Mitral is below. The A atop thing works beautifully. Okay, systole is this pumping part. Diastole is this part. Do, 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 do. Definitely watch the whole thing. Don't flip through like I am. So preload shows contractility, compliance, afterload. You want to know all of those. And that's just a sign of the Frank scurling thing. So, okay, so width is changing, so preload. Okay, so if I had to guess what this is, this is probably a regurge. I get increased end diastolic volume, increased stroke volume. Okay, these are parameters that happen in regurge. Both stenosis have decreased end diastolic volume and decreased stroke volume. Okay, so we'll keep going a little bit. Talks about that same formula that we saw before. Oh, look, increase afterload, a top, super high. Increase stroke um, and systolic, and look, decrease cyst uh, stroke volume. So this is probably aortic stenosis or hypertension. Okay. Do, do, do. Oh, contractility changes. So pop quiz, what type of heart failure? Blues, clues. Um, interesting. Did you know that um, Luna and Molly, the girl who played the clown, um, she actually directs the new Blue Cl Blues Clues, which I think is really interesting. Both Canadian shows. Um, so yeah, we have an decreased stroke volume because we can't get any out. Decreased contractility. This would be something that would cause our left heart failure. Okay. Versus this one, which is a compliance change. So this is our finger guns, right heart failure. That's a lie. Diastolic heart failure. Diastolic heart failure is all about our compliance. Okay, since we just talked about that, I'm gonna go right back to my first aid and remind myself what the heck diastolic heart failure is, right? Diastolic heart failure, often due to myocardial hypertrophy. Okay, so like hokum and stuff. All right, or amyloidosis, right? That fills it up. Cool. All right, back to the video. Aortic stenosis, see, super tall. Mitral regurge, look at that width. Aortic regurge, width is affected, not the height. Cool, mitral stenosis. Uh, this one doesn't affect things as much because you have to remember that what we're looking at is the left ventricle and the left ventricle doesn't change that much with mitral stenosis, it's really the atria. But the ventricles won't fill properly, so everything's just gonna be a little bit smaller. Okay, cool. So we just reviewed that. You would watch it, you'd spend 45 minutes on it, Great, then we'd go back to the lecture, okay? Okay, this is another Frank Sterling curve. We can also look at this in first aid in our physio. I know this is going way back to term one, guys, but you only have to know certain situations. You don't need to know everything. We're talking about heart failure here. Heart failure is high yield. Okay, so I think this is the same picture. Yeah, more or less. So right here, we're looking at a uh, cardiac flow loop. So we see the anotropy, which we just talked about, was contractility. This is the normal, increased, uh, decreased. Okay, so those are the red lines. That's what we're seeing right here. So obviously, normal is going to have more contractility than heart failure. And heart failure treatment is going to be slightly better than that one. Okay, we're also seeing an increased preload. All right. What is this? Decrease in inotropy. Okay, we just talked about that. So the red line is heart failure for sure. And then it said decrease in stroke volume. We talked about that. That was on our list. And a rise in preload. Okay, that's our fluid overload. So we'll write that down. So they're saying that we're going to have more fluid over here. So we can see that here too. This is our uh, more of our venous return. We're obviously going to have more venous return because when I read it, that heart failure thing, everything was more venous return, more venous return, more venous return. So we're going to be up here. We're going to have a, uh, on the x-axis, we're going to come all the way over here. Okay, so y-axis taller, x-axis all the way to the right. 
Okay, so that's what we see here, uh, shorter and all the way to the right. Okay, and since we talked about the preload, let's add that to our list. Oops, wrong tab. So I'm going to want to say increased preload, which is the width, um, there because fluid overload. Okay, so I'll just help you guys out a little bit here. Afterload is vasoconstriction of arterioles, which is hypertension, aortic stenosis. Okay, preload is fluid and veins. Fluid in the veins, congestion. Okay. Back to the lecture. Okay, ventricular filling is impaired, increased end diastolic, ejection fracture remains normal. So this is the diastolic one, okay? We know the diastolic has a normal ejection fracture. That's in the first aid. We know it's named that way, in the first aid. I'm not writing it down. Here's the pressure volume loop. Oh, look, the compliance is changing. Same as the first aid picture, not writing it down. Causes, increased stiffness. Well, we just said that the only cause listed was hypertrophy, like due to um, hokum or amyloidosis or something. Here we can see the hypertrophic causes. Um, hokum. also causes uh, Frederick's ataxia, hypertension, etc. Here we go. Okay, once again, decreased compliance, increased end diastolic pressure, secondary to myocardial hypertrophy. So I don't need to write this down. This is consistent with my first aid. This is everything I know. Oh, look, hokum, amyloidosis, just like Grace has been saying, long-standing hypertension, coronary artery disease. Long-standing hypertension can cause diastolic or systolic. So like, not memorizing that, okay? Um, you can also have constrictive pericarditis, also pretty low yield, but it happens usually due to like radiation or something. Neurohumoral changes, ooh, sounds fancy. Okay, increased catecholamines and sympathetics. I made a big deal about that, I wrote that down. RAS system, wrote that down, made a big deal about it. ADH plays a role, it's not a crazy big role, but it is part of an extension of RAS. And we also talked about BNP and ANP, and we talked about that kind of uh, seesawing effect and how the BNP will be high, but it's not as strong as RAS. So these guys are going to win, even though they're all high. And we also said that BNP is actually something we test in a hospital to see if you're fluid overloaded, if your ventricles are fluid fluid. Okay. Um, increased sympathetics. Okay, we made a big deal about this. Sympathetics, catecholamines, early in heart failure. This is what's going to increase our heart rate, increase our vasoconstriction. Increases cardiac contractility and rate. Initially, it will be helpful, but then it leads to increased preload, which makes things worse, and afterload, which worsens heart failure. Okay, so basically the idea is, um, for instance, you have hypertension, right? So your vasoconstriction. So your heart starts to fail. So then you do RAS and catecholamines or sympathetics, which causes more vasoconstriction, which makes the heart fail more. Which is exactly why if we wanna stop this, we do beta blockers because beta blockers block both renin and sympathetics, right? And why we also want our ACE inhibitors and our spirolactone, okay? Those are our three main guns. And again, for the lung symptoms, we want our loop diuretics, okay, furosemide. Remember that furosemide works on the TAL and it works on our triple co-transporter. Some pathophys for renal for you guys coming up. Okay, let's see what else. Okay, so it makes it worse. Okay, it's always going to be increased, but it makes it worse. Um, RAS. So what is RAS doing? So this is when I'm going to go back to my first aid. Okay, 
So this is what we're talking about down here. Okay, so the left ventricular contractility, pulmonary congestion. The decreased cardiac output, it's going to increase RAS and sympathetics, okay, which is going to increase salt and water, which it adds to our pressure and makes peripheral edema and things worse. Um, it's trying to compensate, but it's just going to make everything worse and it's going to increase your preload. Um, the sympathetics are supposed to increase your contractility, but eventually will just cause complete weakness when it gives up. Okay, reduced blood flow. Oh, reduced renal blood flow is what activates RAS. Remember your like um, glomerular filtration and everything like that. You have that juxtaglomerulus apparatus that produces renin um, near the efferent arteriole. Um, hyperactivity of RAS initiates a vicious cycle. So this is what I just wrote. The vasoconstriction makes the afterload and preload worse, which makes the heart cycle worse. The cycle repeats. This is what we would call in the hospital, we say, oh, someone's circling the drain. They're just getting worse and worse and everything their body's doing making it worse. Okay. Cytokines. This is something we don't talk about too much in heart failure. It's happening, but it's not really like a mainly inflammatory. It's really a hydrostatic process. But when your body is sick, we can see an increased interleukin-1, which can stimulate hypertrophy. We can see a tumor necrosis alpha factor, which can cause um, myocyte hypertrophy and really like cachexia. It can really make you lose weight. Endothelin. This is something that we really talk about with pulmonary hypertension, um, but it's there. This is really the only one we talk about when we talk about heart failure. Okay, but if you wanted to write these things down, technically this is the first thing in the lecture that I haven't seen in first aid. So you know what? Sure. Increased interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha causing apoptosis and myocyte hypertrophy. Okay, that's something they could technically ask me, although it's not high yield and isn't in my first aid. It's not going to be anywhere in Rx. It's just a thing that technically they're asking me. Okay, the BNP, definitely. Um, you know what? Let's just, because we're here, let's see what first aid, if I can control F, BNP. There should be it somewhere. So I'm going to let that do its little search. Okay, BNP, remember that it's Seagra and Grump, um, which makes sense because it's a vasodilator. All of our vasodilators, like nitrates, work on our grumps. Um, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, we're going to be fluid overloaded, so increased BNP, that matches. Let's see if anything else. Okay, BNP is due to myocyte in the ventricle. Um, it's a sign of acute decompensated heart failure. Great. Okay, we're almost done here. It's just not on BMP. Cellular changes. Okay, so this is another thing that isn't really talked about in the first aid. Inefficient intracellular cellular calcium handling, right? So calcium is in control of our inotropy. And so if inotropy is decreased, our contractility is decreased, our calcium isn't working super well. It's not that we have low calcium, it's just that it's not working super well. Um, adrenergic desensitization, so many catecholamines that it's eventually not working. Um, myocyte hypertrophy, we have talked about that, apoptosis and eventual fibrosis, sometimes happening, sometimes doesn't. The cellular changes, oh, my computer's dying. The cellular changes in ventricular myocardium and heart failure known as ventricular remodeling. Remember, we had those three drugs due to preload, due to RAS, that would block this and prevent it and it increased life. So remodeling, calcium problems, myocyte hypertrophy, cell death. Okay, and this is a nice kind of summary for you. Okay, this is a summary. So these are the two pages that I would screenshot and save in that thing and memorize. Okay, so overall that took me about 30 minutes, you know, longer than I would want, but I would still fit within the hour. Okay, heart failure type 2, dyspnea. I'm not looking at that. Shortness of breath in the first aid. Um, balloon. Okay, this is something that we didn't talk about. The swan GANS catheter. This is one I would screenshot and put in your list. This is the pump. Dyspnea is pulmonary congestion. Great.
I'm just gonna move you guys over here. So I'm click through. Do, 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 do. Uh, parasophenal nocturnal dyspnea. We talked about that. That was in the first aid. I don't care. Orthopnea. Blood pooling in the pulmonary circulation. Venus return. We talked about that. Propped up by several or more pillows. Very important. Um, VQ mismatch. This is something that you could review. So um, this is obviously a perfusion, a blood problem. So we're going to have that. And when we have perfusion problems, it's a dead space problem. Okay. So usually we talk about that in pulmonary embolisms, but we could talk about it with heart failure. So um, you have an increased work of breathing, your vital capacity changes. These are things that you could add. Okay. Oh, look, our juxtaglomerular capillary receptors. Okay. So I'm not going to go through this whole second lecture, but you guys get the idea. If it's not in first aid, you add it to the list. Okay. Ah, here's the BNP section. Release from AMP and ventricles and BNP from the ventricles in response to increased volume may act as a check on the renin adgesterone system. They mean like um, the seesaw. Relax the smooth muscle versus via grump to increase GFR and decrease renin. Also dilates afferent arterioles and constricts efferents, promotes naturesis, it makes you pee. So that's our big thing about BMP. All right, so I'm just going to leave it there. That's kind of the idea. Spend a half an hour after you watch your videos and you finish your first aid to kind of review the concept and review the, the lecture, but don't go crazy in detail with it. I know it's easier for me because I'm more familiar with the concepts, but you'll get better at it. All right, so uh, there you go, guys. Good luck. And I rem remember, I promise it gets easier with renal and pulmonary. You just got to do your best with cardio.